Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. I just remember that I, I remember the summer, the summer that I read it, I was 11, and my stepfather was, wor had a, was working on a project in Hawaii, and I, we lived in San Francisco, so we had gone to Hawaii for the summer, and we would every you know, other day go to the library, take out more books, and so I took out Rebecca, and I remember being overtaken by the book in a way that my mother decided was unhealthy. <laughs> She suggested I stop reading it because I just felt, I felt consumed by it to the point where, you know, if reading is always about finding a portal into another world and having that, that transcendent feeling of being in two places at once, somehow the balance had tipped and I was kind of not able to function in my, in my world because of how, how disturbed I was by the world I was reading about. So that, that really stayed with me. And of course I didn't stop reading it, are you kidding? Um, and I haven't reread that book because I don't want to discover that it's actually sort of a cheesy gothic story. Um, and in fact, I love that it's a cheesy gothic story and I ended up writing kind of a cheesy gothic story myself, which I think arose out of some of the, first of all, the gothic tropes that were dear to me partly because they were essential to that story and also just um, hoping to kindle that same otherworldly excitement and, and anxiety that I felt reading Rebecca. I think I figured out I wanted to be a writer late in that I really was a very science-oriented kid. And I really, at, at that time when I was 11, when I discovered Rebe Rebecca, I still wanted to be a doctor. Um, my grandfather was an orthopedic surgeon, and he was, he had kind of a classic surgeon's personality, very kind of macho and loud, and he would come home from the hospital when I was visiting, and he would have a martini, and he would crunch the ice and talk about cutting people open and, you know, solving their problems, and I loved that. Um, and so, and he had all these medical books, which I would read, or not read, I loved the pictures. I was ghoulish. Um, I loved, I loved irregularity and I loved the idea of, of intervening in the human body, like cutting people open and seeing what, what they were made of. So that was sort of my assumption for a long time. I, I, I had a chemistry set. I was just that kind of kid. And then I got very squeamish as a teenager and suddenly none of that seemed very appealing anymore. But then I formed a new goal, which was archaeology. So I still was not thinking I would ever be a writer, although I, I mean, I love to read the whole time. But with archaeology, it's funny, in a certain way, looking back, it was metaphorically very similar to the wish to be a surgeon, which had to do with cutting something open, in this case, the earth, and finding this exciting hidden interior that would reveal certain things about human life. So it was almost exactly analogous. And so I took a gap year between high school and college, and my goal was to be <laughs> somewhat unrealistic, to be paid by university archeology span programs to dig for them in exciting places like Greece and Africa and Asia. And so I wrote to all these archeology span programs and said, you know, I'm a high school graduate and I've got a year to kill. Won't you fly me to some place and, and if you'll pay me, I'll dig for you. Well, obviously that was a ridiculous idea and I only got one response from someone at, the, at Berkeley, who was you know, right next door to where I was, who said, you know, dear Miss Egan, uh, our graduate students pay us <laughs> to take them on digs, so we are not going to be paying you to do anything and you're not qualified. But here's a newsletter, because of course this is before the internet, and um, this was a newsletter for people interested in archeology, span and he said, if you'll notice, there are some small digs you can pay to go on. And so these small digs were in places like Illinois, not what I had envisioned, but I did pay to go on one, and it was three weeks long, and it was in Campsville, Illinois. It was about 98 degrees, and I discovered immediately that archeology span was nothing like I had imagined, because we weren't cutting anything. We were shaving the earth down, and then we were re revealing these very tiny sh shards of pottery. And it was, it was fascinating, but it, it was so clear to me that it was the metaphor that I was excited by, not the physical reality. So 
of course, then it was September and I now had no plan for my gap year and gap years were not very common then. And my parents both thought I was out of my mind. So I, I, made, I worked in a cafe for most of that year. But what I ultimately did was get a backpack and come to Europe, which is a much more normal thing for a European kid to do to travel around on trains. But for a Californian, it was, first of all, a really long trip um, and also just not as common. So I did that and it was incredibly thrilling. I mean, to be in another culture really for the first time, many other cultures and um, and in that. But it was also very lonely in certain ways. Again, technologically, it's almost hard to conjure the kind of solitude one had on a trip like that because there was obviously no internet, no cell phones and nine hour time difference. And, you know, there weren't even answering machines yet. <laughs> so I'm definitely dating myself, but it's worth it to uh, make this point. So it was really the solitude that I experienced on that trip that made me understand how crucial writing was for me, because I felt its, its inherent inherency in any kind of relationship I had to the world, whether it was positive or negative, it just felt like it, it gained its meaning from this reflection in writing. And so I emerged from that trip knowing what I wanted to do. So it, in a way, the gap year really worked, <laughs> just not in the way I intended. I don't think I was someone who, and I say this is not modesty, this is actually a fact. I don't think that I showed any great promise at that point. I don't think anyone seeing me, seeing my writing would have thought, okay, she's really got something. I did whatever I had or have was not visible at that time. But uh, what I did have was determination and I was willing to work hard. And I guess there were probably little flashes of, of decent, you know, images or a sense of language. Um, and so, but I, I did not, I was not a student who was sort of lauded as a great, as being of great promise. And I really see that looking back as such a good thing. I didn't feel like I had a lot of false hopes on me. I felt genuinely unobserved. And <clears throat> so I guess the first thing I did was that I, I got a scholarship to study at Cambridge, um, which was very hard to get actually. And so that was just a chance to do more reading and to start writing a novel, which I had had an idea for in um, college. So I, did, I, I wrote that novel. Um, or I, I, I thought I wrote that novel. Um, I, wrote, I wrote a lot of pages. I typed them up. I hoped they were brilliant. And then I moved to New York, basically just hoping that I could send this out and become very famous uh, immediately, like a whole generation of writers seemed to have done just before that, uh, which included people like Jay McInerney, um, Brett Easton Ellis, um, uh, Tama Janowitz and a guy who is my exact or maybe one year older than I am from Yale, David Levitt, who had already published a collection of stories. So I thought, now it's my turn. So I had this manuscript, which was very long and, and somewhat unread by anyone, kind of including me, in that I had typed it up, but I hadn't really revised it. So I moved to New York and I started sending this thing out and no one could read it and, and they just could not get through it. And people would start avoiding me after I had sent it to them. So I noticed that people became very hard to reach after they had received this manuscript that even briefly included my mother, um, who was really not sure what to say to me. Anyway, it was dreadful. Um, so. There I was in New York where I didn't know really anyone. I had a few friends from college, but it was two years later by now. They all had jobs and I had this atrocious manuscript. And I mean, really, it was not a great moment. But what I did was I, t I enrolled in a couple of workshops in New York. And so I used those as a way of starting to get better. And it, it was I had sort of I, I hadn't discovered what my own writing process is yet. And all I had done was write a terrible first draft. And I thought that was the book. Now I understand that that's the first step in years of work. I just hadn't done the years of work. I wanted the reward, of course, don't we all? Um, and so it, what began at that point was a very incremental process of improvement. 
which I did without getting an MFA, which is very common in the States um, as a way of getting that education. But I mean, at that point, I, I think I and everyone in my family felt I had spent enough time at universities and it was time to join the real world. So I did menial work for years while I slowly improved with the help of peers, you know, in these writing groups. and. And it was just a very slow process. You know, I, I eventually went back to that novel. I read it. I thought, oh, my God, no wonder no one could talk to me. It had to be thrown out. But I was still interested in the ideas, basically sort of started fresh. And that became my first novel. So the entire thing has been incremental. There were not a lot of huge turning points until fairly recently. Um, and I felt great frustration along the way because maybe everywhere, but certainly in America, there is such a, a, a hunger for the story of the immediate success, the young prodigy, the star. And I could not seem to conform to that scenario. Um, I, like I sold the story when I was pretty young to The New Yorker, which was a big break, but I didn't have a lot to follow that up with. So it didn't, again, there was not an explosion and in retrospect, I am so grateful for that. I think it's such a, a difficult thing to manage in, the, in terms of a long career. That sort of immediate um, notoriety and stardom can make it very hard to work in one's own private way, which is right, what writing has to be. So I am, I am very grateful, despite my frustration along the way, that things moved so gradually for me because I, ca I was able to keep getting better. And in the end, you know, if something freezes the process at a really early point, that is not good news in terms of a long career. You have to keep getting better. And if I don't feel like I'm still getting better, I'll just switch to journalism full time because I feel like in some ways that has a more immediate effect on the world. And it's only fun if I feel like I'm doing something I've never done before and kind of stretching myself in new ways. So I think I, I've been able to do that. I, somehow the world's very gradual response gave me the freedom and the privacy to keep developing. Well, I was reading avidly in those years, but I think one thing that's sort of strange is I don't recall feeling any confidence that I had anything original to contribute. So I didn't have that sort of quiet knowledge that I was you know, everyone would know me someday. Not at all. I assumed that I would always labor in obscurity. I think I assumed that because you could, I could also imagine that I must have thought somewhere in myself that I had something to give or I would have lost my determination. But I think that the key is that my motivation is, is not so much a belief in what I can do as a, a tremendous joy in this transcendent process of engaging with another world that has nothing to do with the one I live in. And, and, and so I think that's really what has motivated me. I'm also perfectionistic. And when I, when I get criticism, I find that in the moment, I sometimes, you know, want to disown the critic, <laughs> which in the case of that first novel meant, you know, my mother and basically everyone I knew, I was considering never speaking to them again. But once I get over that phase, I find that I immediately start problem solving. My, it's, fiction is one of those things that for me happens without effort. I mean, it takes a lot of effort, but I'm working on it even if I'm not actively working on it. So it feels like it kind of has a life of its own through me. And that sense of being acted through and I've, how you interpret that depends on your cosmology. But for me, I would just say it's the unconscious um, sort of pushing through with responses to the culture and the world around me, that is so essential to my well-being that, that I think that more than anything else is really what kept me going. In terms of writers who inspired me along the way, I mean, there were many. There are, there are writers that I sort of see as being part of my literary DNA, and then there are specific bodies of work that I've engaged with very actively for each of my books, which are so different from each other that I feel are often in conversation with other books. 
But the literary DNA, I would say, you know, probably if I had to pick one book, it would be The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton, which is just such a masterpiece. Um, more contemporary, uh, Don DeLillo was a huge influence in, on me and my entire generation, so I'm certainly not alone in that. Um, I love the writer Robert Stone, who passed away a few years ago and, and had a huge influence. Um, Joyce Carol Oates, her freedom and her looseness and her willing to tr willingness to try anything, certain of her books were had a big impact on me as well. Um, the writer Ethan Kanan, who's around my age, and he's an example of someone who is an instant star, but I, he's not publishing so much now. I'm not quite sure why. I think he's also a doctor, so maybe that's why. See, he actually did it all. <laughs> um, anyway, he, I remember when his first book came out, which I think was called The Emperor of the Air, I was incredibly wowed by that. Uh, Mary Gateskill's first collection, Bad Behavior, had a huge impact. I mean, these are people who are close to my age, maybe a little older, so these were peers. Michael Shaven's first book, The Mysteries of Pittsburgh, dazzling and he's someone who became an immediate star and has continued to grow and flourish and I think that's a testament to his kind of strong spirit um, so lots and lots of people but then each of my books so for example my first novel The Invisible Circus which is very much about nostalgia for the 1960s among people who never experienced that era sort of what that era has come to mean versus what it really was and and that kind of exploring the, the chasm between those things and also just the nature of nostalgia itself. And so um, I, a couple of books that really influenced me as I was working on that were James Salter's A Sport and a Pastime, beautiful book. Um, also Joyce Carol Oates' book, You Must Remember This, I think was a big one. Um, and then a huge body of work about the 60s that was just coming out as I was kind of returning to, to this project in the late 80s, um, particularly uh, Todd Gitlin's work. He has, a, he has a lot of great theory about the interaction of media with the counterculture and the, the difficulty both the counterculture and the world at large had at decoding, deconstructing the impact of mass media because it was so new and certain distortions about the counter, counterculture that resulted which impacted the counterculture itself in, in, the, um, in the theory of Todd Gitlin, who was the head of SDS, which was a huge student political organization in the late 1960s. So a lot of theory and a lot of fiction, and that's usually the way it goes for me. For me, writing is very much a process of exploration and discovery. I mean, I start a, even a whole book with no more than a sense of time and place. I don't have characters, I certainly don't have a story. And I, I really engage in almost what you might call automatic writing. But what I think actually the best uh, analogy would be improvisation. So I sort of start going and I'm looking for a line of logic or dialogue or interaction that feels alive and I just keep going. And I try to write five to seven pages a day it's, it's very illegible, which is great from my point of view, because I don't want to be reading it. I just want to be writing it. The next day, I reread what I wrote the day before just to return to the, to the moment, and then I don't look at it again until I have a whole draft. So I just keep going. And so, you know, needless to say, there's a lot of crap in this. I mean, if you watch improv or listen to musical improvisation, there are good moments and good runs, and then there are things that don't go anywhere. That's the nature of it. So what I'm looking for is, is to be surprised by ideas and possibilities that I can't think of consciously. And so that sense of discovery is, is thrilling. <laughs> it's incredibly fun. Um, and it's what, I, it's what I love most about it. It's the reason something like autofiction, which is very much in fashion now, is could not be further from what I'm interested in. Not out of any judgments, because autofiction reads the same way as anything else. If it's good, it just reads like fiction. But because for me, my own life is of zero interest and cannot transport me in this way that I'm describing. There's no surprise in trying to capture the nuances of my day. Are you kidding? Like, 
no, that's not what I'm interested in. So that sense of discovery is really important. In terms of what I think fiction is, and, and the thing that I think is special about it, and maybe some of the reasons that I like to write it, to me, it functions as a sort of dream life of the culture. You know, when we sleep, we are all fiction writers, and we write very sophisticated, symbolic texts that are sometimes, you know, laughably easy to decode, and sometimes very mysterious and compelling. You know, you'll have a dream that really stays with you. I, I remember little bits of dreams that I've even had years ago. So to my mind, a, a fiction writer is doing that for the culture at large. And I'm very aware, I think another reason I like to write in this more unconscious state is that I, I'm looking to be a vehicle for all kinds of material and possibilities that I am not even consciously aware of, because so much is going on that we can't always perceive in the moment. We, we perceive a lot, but there's only so much that we can. Um, so I, I want all of that stuff to act through me. And I am, I am amazed by how much, how, even really obvious symbolism ends up in my work without my realizing it. Obvious enough, enough to, that I sometimes have to remove it, but I wasn't aware of putting it there. So I'm trying to act I'm trying to basically receive as much as possible from every side, internally and externally, and, and distill and synthesize it into an artifact that hopefully has, first of all, is compelling and transporting for the reader, but also has that sort of cultural significance and power that, that work can only have if cultural forces are acting on it, if the writer has allowed that to happen. Um, and so that's what I see the enterprise as being. And it does take very hard work because even though I'm relying on improv uh, to, to, to gather up my original material, I then have to, have to synthesize and edit and do, you know, easily 50, 60 drafts of certain parts to really make it do the thing that I've now decided it could maybe do which is hopefully something I never could have actually thought up consciously. I, I write fiction by hand, which is definitely inefficient. Um, but the reason I do it, actually there are many reasons. One is I do think there's something, at least for me, that's meditative about the physical act of writing. Now, typing is also a physical act, but the problem with that for me is that seeing what I'm writing on a screen in a typeface makes it very hard to have the kind of blind tumbling, automatic, impulsive feeling that I want and need to have to write anything good. As a journalist, I write all on a computer, and what I'm, because that's an active synthesis of material I've already absorbed, it's fine to think, oh, I got, you know, I, I, to be fussing and tinkering with every sentence as I go. But I, if I do that, I'm, I'm fiddling with the surface of something that is hopefully a thousand fathoms deep, I'm not going to be able to cover what I need to cover if I'm fussing with a sentence. So I can't really read my writing very well. That's great. Um, the act of writing has a certain meditative quality. And I think too, I, I, it helps me with not rereading it. I don't, I often don't remember very well what the beginning of something is like. It, with my novel Manhattan Beach, which took a year and a half to write the first draft of, I had forgotten whole characters. I had forgotten their names, their personalities. I just reinvented them, and then I picked the best. So I don't feel like I lose anything by staying in a state of blindness, except maybe time. But it's a price I'm willing to pay, because what I gain is this kind of openness, culturally, psychologically. It, it seems to give me the, the greatest possible range of material that I can sort of capture, and then put to my own uses. I've have had to do research for all of my books, um, st you know, starting with The Invisible Circus, which published in 95, so pre-internet for me. <laughs> Some people knew about the internet then. So that meant I was going to the library and doing research on uh, pacif pacifist student groups who became rad radicalized to the point of actually becoming terrorist groups. I have a very long-standing interest in modern terrorism that dates right back to my first book. Um, and so that meant going to the library. 
uh, and, and I still do that. But with that book and probably every one of my other books, there was almost no research I needed to do just to get going. Like I could start. Um, in the case of A Visit from the Goon Squad, I did have to do research uh, to write the second chapter, which I thought was just a freestanding short story. And it was about the music industry. And I, I didn't even understand the, the difference between analog and digital recording. So even to write a short story, as I thought it was, I had to spend some hours on the phone with a music producer. Those conversations were so compelling and actually quite moving because it was really talking to him that made me understand that the music industry was in a huge free fall, that digitization had gutted the industry and that no one knew what would happen. And so there was this sense of before and after in everything he said. And I, I and a sense of time passing and, and how accelerating that passage of time had, had how, how technology had accelerated in a relatively short amount of time. And all of those discoveries, I think, really were what led me to write A Visit from the Goon Squad. So that's a case where research suggested a kind of magnitude that I hadn't even imagined around a topic. So there's a lot of interaction for me between research and writing. It also, pieces that I've written as a journalist have led almost directly to books. Um, just to give you one example, in the year 2000, and so now we're really going a ways back, I wrote a piece for the Times Magazine about the secret out lives that closeted gay teens were living online. Now, I had maybe had email for four years by then, and all I was doing was, you know, exchanging email with people. There was no social media yet, but there were bulletin boards. So closeted gay teens were finding each other on these bulletin boards and living what they considered to be their real lives online with relationships, sexual relationships, groups of friends. Um, I had never heard of instant messaging, but I quickly got up to speed on that because that's how I communicated with all of the teens as well. I couldn't go meet them. Are you kidding? They were living in, in places where they feared, especially the boys, that they would actually be killed if it were known that they were gay. So, but what was fascinating was that they considered these to be their real lives, and yet these lives were fraught with deception, as online culture probably always will be, and it most commonly in the form of adults pretending to be kids in order to engage in these relationships with these teens. So that, all of that got me thinking, how can we even talk about, is the, is the binary real versus unreal even applicable to our current experience? where more and more of our experience is virtual. Now, I was asking that in the year 2000, and it led me pretty directly to write my gothic thriller, which was certainly inspired by Rebecca and the many other gothic works I've read since, but, but, but connected to this very abstract and rather philosophical question about the nature of how we describe reality in a, in a, a context of so much experience being what we would once have called unreal, but which certainly is real if it's experience. Um, so that was a case of an entire novel really arising from a journalistic inquiry of several months. Um, in the case of Manhattan Beach, I knew I wanted to write about New York during World War II and I knew pretty much nothing about it. So for about five years while I was writing other books, I began a kind of slow immersion into just knowing enough about that time and particularly some atmospheres from that time that I could begin my lurching improvisational process. And I can say pretty clearly I could never have written that book if I hadn't worked as a journalist because there's so much technical detail, so much historical detail, and I really knew nothing about any of it. So I think I just wouldn't have had the the heart to continue in such a state of ignorance if I hadn't known from experience that you can, you can know nothing and know nothing and know nothing and then suddenly you know that there is this strange fluency that can happen. It feels like it happens suddenly, but it's just the discovery that finally you've done enough that you actually have learned quite a bit. So I, once I began writing, and began to have any remote inkling of what my story would be, 
in some way, the real research began then because now I knew what I needed to know. But that first five years was also really important. And I did a lot of experiential research then. I, I got to know deep sea divers. I went to a reunion of military divers. They dressed me in the old diving equipment. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I, I helped with an oral history project interviewing people who had worked at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. So all of that was really fun. And uh, it, it certainly enriched the book, but it was enriching a book that had absolutely no uh, story or characters yet. I would say overall my books skew male. Um, certainly the keep is almost entirely male and men tend to like it better than women, interestingly. Um, and even Goon Squad, I had to struggle to keep it 50% female. I kept sliding toward male, and it was only when I added one chapter after that I had already sold the book, which was the PowerPoint chapter, that I got it back to 50-50. So I love writing from a male point of view because it immediately separates the consciousness that I'm entering from my own in a kind of easy way. Um, Women are harder for me because there's the danger that they will remind me of myself and then I'm not interested in them. So I would say it's a bigger challenge for me to write about women. And even with Manhattan Beach, um, there are two male protagonists and one female. Page, if you count the pages, it is still more than 50% male, but the female is the core of it, and it's really her relationship to the two men that is central. So I think I still can call it a book about a woman. <laughs> but it's, it's tricky for me, because since my goal is to get as far away as possible from my own life, the temptation to write as a man is, is omnipresent for me. It's, I, it, I, my consciousness has to be raised about not doing that too much. Um, so that said, you know, I'm a, I'm a feminist and I'm one of the things I'm very interested in is the, the difficulty of female strength in the world, sort of female power and how it, how it can struggle sometimes to thrive in, in the world around it. Um, and that is certainly what we see in, in the main character, Anna in Manhattan Beach, but it, it is, I mean, I feel sort of guilty saying it, but it is a little bit of an effort for me to to stick with women because I think the other thing I, I maybe should have said about fiction before is that to me, what part another aspect of what makes it so much fun to write and to read is that it's really the only art form, the only narrative art form that gives us full access to another consciousness. I mean, we are so isolated in our own consciousnesses. We have no idea, really, how other people see the world, even the people closest to us, which is such a painful paradox sometimes. And it's the reason you can feel alone at, at very intimate moments, because in the end, we are encased in this rich, complicated, multimedia scramble of sounds, words, memories, impressions, uh, modes of interpretation and we have no idea how much other people are like us in those ways. So to me, fiction is a chance to actually have the experience of being someone else from the inside. And that's incredibly exciting. Um, and so I, that motivates me enormously. And I guess, again, the temptation to cross that gender boundary is enormous. Um, because I think we are always a little more mystified by the opposite gender. Maybe there's the, the tendency to assume, I mean, I, I believe that all humans are basically the same, but our experiences are so different that they cause us to be extremely different. Um, and so, uh, but, but finding my way into an alternate consciousness that has been informed by such a different experience and then writing from that is just, it feels uh, enlightening, sort of capital E. <laughs> I don't feel a responsibility to write feminist fiction, whatever that is, um, because I, I don't like didactic fiction generally. I, I feel like fiction that has a strong message usually uh, relays that message at the expense of a lot of other things. 
which are really important to me, um, like complexity and depth and ambiguity. You know, I actually think messages are, are just, for, for, to my mind, don't really have a place in fiction because I think that I, I, maybe it's partly because I'm a journalist and a nonfiction writer. To me, that's the realm in which you can answer questions. But for me, the job of fiction is to raise questions. And I love inhabiting, let's say, a very sexist point of view. And I do that in Goon Squad. I mean, I have a, a loathsome character who, you know, basically ruins the life of a young girl by picking her up when she's hitchhiking when she's 17 and she ends up not even graduating from high school. I mean, he's, he's a real problem, but I adore the man because I understand his choices from the inside. And that, so it, it feels like it sort of expands my, my uh, compassion for any human being. I, I always have that compassion. And so somehow to me, writing work that is overtly feminist, it feels like it would have the same problems that, that a book would have if I had any other sort of didactic message about how the world should be, you know, that we should all believe in God or whatever. I, I respect those views, but fiction informed by views like that, unless it's so good that reading it, you don't know that that's what the writer was trying to do is almost certainly going to feel limited. I'm not that technologically curious. Uh, I'm, I, I, if there's a new gadget, my first thought is, do I have to get it? Not, oh my God, I want it. So that's just one of those things, you know, people fall on one side of that or the other. Technology per se is not interesting to me. I, I find it sort of boring in a way and I, I and, and it I resist it but I'm always looking for new ways to tell a story so if I see some sort of technological possibility that I think would I could use for fiction what's exciting about that is that I if I it, it will only work if I use it to tell a story I couldn't tell any other way that's something I've really learned so what that means is that if I can make something work in that new form I will be telling a story I could never have otherwise told. That's very exciting to me, uh, especially because, as I said before, you know, if I can't keep doing things that feel new and original, I don't think I would want to keep writing fiction. So the possibility of novelty for me is actually very important. However, I, this is not to say that I'm just thrilled about, you know, the omnipresence of smartphones in our world because of all the great possibilities they make for writers. Quite the opposite. I think we, it, it almost goes without saying that it siphons everyone's attention away from re sustained reading. <laughs> um, it's been very good for sustained listening. And I'm actually, that's a very surprising development that I would never have expected. And, and I'm, I love, I love it just on the face of it because I personally adore audiobooks um, and I, I just love listening to fiction on audio if it's good fiction. But also it just shows you that there are a lot of, sometimes there are unintended good consequences that we can't see coming, which is wonderful to know. But the truth is, especially television and the way that television, I mean, what is television? The way that, you know, watching series has become possible everywhere and anywhere for everyone and anyone is not good for the world of fiction, at least in America. It, it, what it means practically is that many writers are now writing for television and hardly writing fiction. It, I hate to say it, but for some reason, when those writers return to writing fiction, it, you sometimes feel the print of, the, of television in the fiction in a way that's not good. And um, it, it means that some of the best and the brightest are writing for television, which then feeds the cycle of the general public fe feeling and saying that television is actually where the best storytelling is happening. And it is the reason that even at a literary party in America, you will find people talking about television rather than books. So all of that is worrisome to me, um, just because I want to see my field strong and because if fiction isn't good, it can't hope to 
remind people of why of what it does that television can't do namely bring us inside the consciousness of another human being which anything any narrative form that is vision is a uh, you know image based is by definition not doing that so i believe very strongly in the 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 potential for fiction to stay strong but only if good people keep writing it so i really do worry about the the kind of image world siphoning away our talent and our consumers sometimes i just get it flat out wrong so for a visit from the goon squad <laughs> the first sentence as i wrote it originally it's about a woman who is about to steal another woman's wallet the first sentence i wrote was she knew it was wrong i mean <laughs> wow so that was a terrible start and its only job was to be crossed out in the very next draft and replaced with something else but i don't think it um i i, I think oh wait, it, and then ultimately the sentence was it began the usual way in the bathroom of the Lasimo Hotel. So that's, you know, a few steps removed from she knew it was wrong. It's actually a different tech, it's a different approach altogether. It's, it's pulling back rather than being right inside her head. Um, but sometimes the first sentence has actually been the thing that I can follow into the rest of the story. And that was true with Manhattan Beach, where the first sentence remained almost the same. And it's something like, uh, they had nearly reached Dexter Stiles' house before Anna realized that her father was nervous. And I didn't know who any of those people were yet until I wrote that sentence. And, but I liked the fact that I, there, ideally a first sentence suggests, ideally every sentence in a work of fiction and every paragraph and every chapter is just um, radiating more information than is actually conveyed by the words and that should start with the first sentence so if you think about that that particular sentence i've introduced my three main characters we understand that two of them are making a visit to the third and that they're a father and a daughter and we understand that the the there's something frightening about this person they're visiting to the point that it makes the father nervous and we understand that this daughter is perceptive enough that she understands her father's inner life all of those things are actually really important. And once I wrote that, I could, I had somewhere to go because I, I myself received so much information from that sentence that I just followed it into the story. Um, another first sentence that remained much as it was when I first wrote it was the first sentence of Look at Me, which is my favorite actually of my novels. And the first sentence is, after the accident, I became less visible. And once again, it suggests a history a past and a future and it, it also already telegraphs the kind of um, philosophical standpoint of that book and even the, the irony that pervades it so ideally it's it's doing a lot of things that's what I always want to see but sometimes it's totally inert like like she knew it was wrong what can you do it's bad I had to cross it out <laughs> I often have no, I mean, I, I write, of course, with no sense of where a book is going at all. And often, even as I'm going through, I mean, I'm not even thinking about the end. I'm just trying to get to the next whatever. But often what I know is where things happen before I know what will happen or who will be involved. So ideally, I start to have a sense of physically and geographically where I want to land in the final movement of a book. And then, you know, out of that comes ultimately the words, often wrong and, you know, getting better with each iteration. Sometimes I, I sort of have a sense of what I want those final words to be. I think I did with Manhattan Beach, um, but, but, it, but the scene leading up to them required a lot of work. So understanding with, with Goon Squad, I actually wrote what turned out to be the final chapter fairly early in the process and that was exciting because once I had the beginning and the end, even though I knew it was a kind of weird book, I really had the confidence that it was a book. Um, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm following a sense of where I need to, it's like a treasure hunt. I, I have to find the place and then I find what's hidden there. Then, then the action reveals itself, but I often don't know who will lead me there. And as I have a sense of characters' trajectories, bringing them to that place where I know 
something's going to happen, I feel very excited because I think, oh, I'm getting to the point where that thing is going to happen. Well, I think what fiction, well, first of all, I have a couple of answers to a, a couple of responsibilities that fiction has, which it carries out simply by being good. So I think that what I should start by saying is, I feel that if I write something really good and original, I have fully fulfilled my responsibilities because <laughs> reading something good, something that has real power, does a couple of things that I think are really important. One is it, it reminds human beings of what the insides of other human beings' minds are like, and that creates compassion and empathy, which are the two qualities that I think are most necessary to our survival as a species. And, and the lack of them, which is selfishness and inwardness, explains so much of what is wrong. Like if you think about something like climate change, you know, the inability to look beyond one's own immediate desires and the wish to have them satisfied at the expense of whatever is at the heart of why my country in particular is having such a hard time actually doing anything about this problem. And it, it, it's, it makes my head explode. I, I don't think that I, writing a screed about climate change is the best way I can help with this problem. Other people are doing that very well, and I'm grateful to them. But I feel that what I can do is keep people reading fiction, because I actually believe that it makes us better human beings, and it awakens the qualities in us that are essential for us to think collectively, which is what we must do. The other thing fiction does, which I really learned in the course of writing Manhattan Beach, is that it is a very useful cultural artifact. One of the things that was most important to me in writing Manhattan Beach was understanding all the things that you can't get from reading history. What are the, you know, what are people remembering? What are their cultural landmarks? What are, what are their cultural touchstones? What are they nostalgic for? Just all that information that is too trivial, really, to be included in, in a history book and maybe too subjective. It's unbelievable how much you get of that from reading fiction. It's like reading oral history and letters and history all at once. So I actually believe more profoundly than ever in the utility of fiction as simply a document of our time. And that gets back to the dream life analogy. You know, it is by creating a kind of artifact of the dream life of our culture, I am preserving it for those who want to understand it from a later point. And I say that specifically from the point of view of someone who just had to do that. And, and I had renewed respect for the importance of fiction as simply a record of, the, of our time. I mean, I guess, you know, I do ask myself, what have I witnessed that's of interest? Um, and certainly one of those stories is, is communications technology. You know, I grew up, I was born in 1962, and really for the first 18 years of my life, there was no telecommunications development that I was aware of. I mean, that's, that seems almost impossible to believe, but it, you know, by the time I was 18, you made a phone call still, and either there was a busy signal or someone answered or it just rang. And, then, and now we're where we are. So I, I think a lot about, about having grown up being, I mean, I'm technically a baby boomer, like the very last of the baby boomers. Um, and, and so I guess I feel like I've seen, I've certainly seen a technological revolution, which has in and of itself, as I said, is not interesting to me per se, but, but I am very interested in the ways that it interacts with people's inner lives and changes our relationships to each other and to ourselves, perhaps most interestingly. Um, and, and a lot of the things that I was interested in resulting from that, like modern terrorism, for example, which is as much an epiphenomenon of image culture as the fashion modeling industry, for example. And I've written about, but I brought all of that together in my novel, Look at Me. But modern terrorism, for all of its horrors, is really just about creating, uh, 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 letting a, rather, a relatively small event proliferate through the media so that it creates a very widespread reaction. 
I was interested in that well before 9-11. And in fact, my novel, Look at Me, came out the week of 9-11. And in it, I have a terrorist fantasizing about blowing up the World Trade Center. This is not because I'm some kind of amazing prophet. It's exactly because of what I said before about letting the culture operate through me. Obviously, all of that was there. I had interviewed FBI counterterrorism people. I knew that there were terrorist cells in America. Um, so, you know, so I'm, I, I, so that, those interests that I think come from the time that I, the, the particular swath of time I've witnessed in my lifetime have continued to, to feel relevant because of many events that have followed, like 9 11, which draw on some of the same um, factors that, that fascinate me. So I guess in that way, I don't know if it's so much where I grew up as when I was born and, and the strange technology lag I experienced from my first, from really my formative years. Um, and then all that's followed. I think, I think that has been really important in my work. And I'm, also, you know, I think a lot about being a, an American and what that means. Um, something that many of us don't feel very proud of right now. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in sort of the American psyche and what that consists of and trying to understand that better always. Because even though I've spent a lot of time abroad and I, I think I look at America very much from the outside in certain ways, I also feel very American. Um, and one thing that fascinates me is the way that image culture interacts with that belief in self-invention, which I think is a very basic element of, of the American psyche and has a lot to do with how we started. Um, but I think one thing I, I'm feeling much more lately, um, starting with working on Manhattan Beach and then kind of edging into the Trump presidency, is how violence is also a really basic part of the American psyche. We really are a, a people and a country that, that is born of violence. We, we, came, we came to reinvent ourselves, but in so doing, and as a means of doing that, we slaughtered you know, untold millions of people. And that kind of thuggish approach to power, that sense of power really meaning you do what I want or I'm gonna kill you, is, is the kind of power that Donald Trump emanates. And he's, he comes very much from that same world. He's from the world of New York real estate, which has associations with organized crime. I mean, we're right back to exactly the underworld I was writing about from the 1940s, when Anna's father is nervous about visiting Dexter Stiles, and we don't even know why. So I guess that those questions, you know, the development of technology and, and its interaction with an American psyche, I think will always be interesting to me.